looks like you're about to do a little steering column work. I see you have all the new special tools on the bench. Right you are, Tech. You know, it's kind of tough keeping up with the new tools that come out every year. It's not half as tough as trying to do a job without the tools. Incidentally, that hammer is one tool you won't need for the new steering column. In fact, you better just leave it in the toolbox. Looks like we'd better ask Tom to explain the impact absorbing column to you. I overheard what you said, Tech, and you're absolutely right. Servicing this new column requires some procedures and precautions we haven't had to think about on past models. First of all, why do we need an impact absorbing steering column? And how does it work? Well, the why is very simple. It reduces the personal injury hazard to the driver in the event of a front end collision. In any front end collision, there are actually two collisions involved. We'll call them primary and secondary collisions. The primary has to do with the car and the secondary with the driver. The primary collision at the instant the car strikes another object is at least partially absorbed by the front end sheet metal. This is one of the design considerations for the front of the car. However, in severe collisions, the frame will also be subject to heavy impact and forced rearward, carrying the steering gear with it. In such instances, a solid steering column would be pushed rearward toward the driver. The secondary collision occurs inside the car when the driver is thrown forward against the steering wheel. Even if the column is not forced rearward, the impact of this secondary collision is mighty rough treatment for the human body to withstand. Then there are two separate impacts to be cushioned, and the forces from these two impacts act in opposite directions, right? That's exactly right, Jerry. Now let's take a look at the impact absorbing column used on all our 67 cars. Well, it's actually pretty simple. The impact absorbing column consists of four principal parts. There's the steering shaft, shift tube, column jacket, and a special breakaway mounting bracket. The steering shaft's made in two pieces, a solid upper section and a hollow lower section. The turning or steering force is transmitted by two flats formed into the upper section, which slide into internal flats in the lower section. Plastic is injected through holes in the lower shaft and fills two grooves around the solid upper shaft. The plastic in the grooves takes up the clearance between the two sections. The plastic in the four holes locates the two sections and acts as shear pins. Even if the pins shear, though, you don't have to worry about the two sections coming apart or about loss of steering. The end of the upper section is staked during assembly, so it won't pull out of the lower section, and the flats maintain the steering function. I noticed that the shift tube is in three sections but I don't see any flats to take care of the turning forces to select gears. That's right, Jerry. The turning load is taken by the plastic inserts that fasten the sections together. Right, Tech. The shift tube has four separate sets of plastic inserts. Each set consists of two rectangular inserts and a round one. The rectangular inserts provide the gradual impact absorption as they are sheared by the sharp edge of the rectangular slots. The edges of the round holes are not as sharp as the edges of the rectangular openings. So the round inserts act like shear pins and prevent road shocks and vibrations from nibbling away at the rectangular impact absorbing inserts. What happens to all these plastic inserts when there's a collision? Patience, Jerry. I suspect that Tom wants to cover the impact absorbing action of all the components at once. Right, Tech. And the next subject is the center section of the column jacket. This perforated section is designed to provide a controlled rate of crush on impact. Under heavy impact, the perforated section folds like an accordion, thus absorbing the impact at a controlled rate. This folding action will occur whether the impact is from a primary collision or a secondary collision. Just above the center section, there's a ramp welded to the column. When the driver impact folds the jacket, the ramp contacts the instrument panel and forces the column downward so it can telescope forward underneath the panel. What happens when the impact comes from the other direction? That's where the new mounting bracket comes in. Let's hear about it, Tom. 
Okay, Tech. The column mounting bracket, which attaches the column to the instrument panel, has a special one-way feature. It can move downward under impact, but not upward. Here's how it works. The bracket fastens solidly to the column with four screws and to the instrument panel with three screws. The three bracket-to-panel screws go through breakaway capsules, which are retained in the bracket by injected plastic shear pins. When the impact is due to a secondary or driver collision, the breakaway capsules will shear off the plastic pins and slide out of the open end of the bracket to panel mounting slots. So, the column can move forward, collapsing the jacket perforations. But on primary collision impact, from the bottom, the capsules can't slide out of the closed ends of the slot in the bracket. This prevents the column from being forced toward the driver. Sounds to me like there are a lot of things going on all at once in the column assembly. You're right, Jerry. Here's a quick rundown on what happens in a severe front-end collision. Now, let's consider the primary and secondary impact separately. The primary impact against the lower end of the column breaks off the pins in the steering shaft. At the same time, the sharp edges in the shift tube start to shear the rectangular inserts. And while this is happening, the column jacket center section folds up like an accordion. As you already know, the column mounting bracket prevents the column from traveling rearward during primary collision impact. The breakaway capsules bear against the closed end of the mounting bracket slots. On secondary impact, when the driver strikes the steering wheel, four things happen simultaneously. First of all, the plastic pins in each breakaway capsule will shear and the ramp will guide the column downward under the instrument panel. At the same time, the steering shaft pins break, the shift tube inserts shear, and the jacket folds. The action is the same as it is in a primary impact, except that the controlled absorption is in the opposite direction. Well, that's pretty easy to understand, Tom, but what happens when you have both a primary and a secondary impact to contend with? Well, Jerry, the easiest way to explain that is to say that the column folds up both ways. Since there are any number of possible degrees of impact from either direction, it's impossible to predict whether the primary impact will take the most absorption or the secondary impact, which happens a fraction of a second later. There are some important precautions that must be taken when you're servicing this new steering column. Most important, of course, is to be very careful how you handle the assembly. A sharp blow on either end will shear the steering shaft plastic pins. Be sure you have the special tools close at hand when you start to service the assembly. Above all, don't use a hammer to drive the shaft in or out of the upper bearing or to remove or install a steering wheel. The steering shaft remover and the holding fixture are new tools developed especially for the impact absorbing column. The wheel remover and the shaft installer are tools from past models. There are some other new essential tools, but they apply only to the tilt-type steering column. Uh, we'll talk about that a little later. Right now, let's look at some of the service procedures on the standard column. Right now, Tom, I think it would be a mighty good idea for someone to turn the record over. The service procedures and precautions for the new steering column are nearly identical for all body styles. And they're covered very well in the new service manuals. So we'll just hit the high spots. Let me repeat that this new column is to be handled carefully. Don't bang it around or you'll shear the plastic inserts. And as Tech said some time ago, leave that hammer in the toolbox. One of the first steps in removing the column is to remove the steering wheel. Be sure to use the wheel removing tool. Don't try to bump the wheel loose with a hammer. When you get ready to lower the column from the instrument panel, be sure to note the number of shims under the forward leg of the bracket and hang out of them. You'll need them when you reinstall the column. Those shims are used to provide correct alignment and prevent any bind in the column assembly. The shims are not used on all cars, though. Only those that have a solid seat for the mounting bracket. On some of the models, the forward leg of the column mounting bracket attaches to a second bracket, which has elongated holes to permit vertical adjustment. So shimming is not necessary. 
Once you get the column assembly out of the car, take off the mounting bracket and wiring trough and attach the new holding fixture. The fixture clamps in a vise, so the column is easier to work on and you're not so liable to drop it and damage the plastic inserts. The tool for removing the steering shaft from the column is essential. After the turn signal switch is removed, use the three switch attaching screws to fasten the tool to the bearing housing. Then, simply turn the screw in the end of the tool to force the shaft out of the bearing. Be careful that the shaft doesn't slide out of the column onto the floor. And I'll warn you again, don't you dare drive that shaft out of the bearing with a hammer. I got the message, Tech. Say, that torque flight shift lever looks different. It is different, Jerry, and so's the gate inside the housing. In fact, none of the parts are interchangeable with previous models. While we're on the subject of shift levers, here's an item that could be confusing. Even the cars with a floor shift have a shift tube in the steering column. It's there to give the column rigidity. The shift tube is retained in the housing by an Allen screw, just as the 66 models are. When the screw is removed, the tube slides out of the shift housing easily. There's one more special tool to be used on the standard steering column. It's used to pull the steering shaft into the upper bearing during assembly. That's the same tool used on earlier models to press the bearing out of the shaft. Now, how about some of the installation precautions, Tom? Coming right up, Tech. Column alignment has always been important to easy steering and good returnability. With this new column, alignment is even more important. Now, first of all, when you put the mounting bracket back on the column, be sure you use the correct screws. If the screws are too long, they'll rub on the shift tube. You have to be careful installing the coupling to the steering gear worm shaft. If you bump the coupling hard, the steering shaft plastic pins will shear. With the coupling installed on the worm shaft, install the two rear mounting bracket capsules. But don't tighten the nuts until the coupling is centered. Now to center the coupling, move the steering shaft up or down until the gauge hole is 13 sixteenths of an inch from the upper face of the coupling cover. That dimension is for all cars except the Dart and Valiant with power steering. On Darts and Valiants with power steering, Measure from the coupling cover to the steel collar. Be sure the collar is tight against the nylon bushing. The dimension is an inch and a quarter for torque flight cars and two and a half inches for cars with manual transmission. Thanks, Tech. When the coupling is centered, tighten the two nuts at the rear of the mounting bracket. The correct torque for these nuts is 95 inch pounds. Installation of the floor plate is an important part of the column alignment. Don't ever use force to line up the bolt holes. If you do, you'll put a bind in the column. Instead, loosen the steering gear assembly attaching bolts and shim the gear to move the shaft and column in the required direction. You'll find the information on shimming the gear in the reference book for this session. Just don't shim more than 90 thousandths of an inch. Thanks, Tech. There's another shim pack involved in column installation at the front leg of the mounting bracket. You should be able to use the same shims you took out during column removal, but be sure to check the gap. If there's more than 60 thousandths gap between the shim pack and the bracket attaching point, add more shims. In fact, cut the gap down as much as possible. On cars with the second bracket, don't use shims. Just loosen the two nuts at the slotted holes. Tighten the column mounting bracket and then retighten the two nuts. When you're ready to put the steering wheel on the shaft, line up the master splines and draw the wheel into place with the retaining nut and washer. Don't drive the wheel on with a hammer. The correct torque for the retaining nut is 24 foot-pounds. A while ago, you mentioned the tilt-type steering column. Do we have time to cover that today? Tell you what, Jerry. If Tom will give you a fast rundown on the unit, I'll promise to do a more complete job in the reference book. Okay, Tech. There have been some changes in the column for 67. Uh, for one thing, there are seven tilt positions instead of the six we had last year.
the wheel can be moved 15 degrees upward or downward from the straight position. You'll find a different spring arrangement, too. A single compression spring at the bottom replaces the two tension springs at the top of the assembly. The seven positions are provided by two lock shoes. One has three teeth, the other has four. One tooth meshes with a lock pin to hold the wheel in any of the seven positions. Here's how it works. The two shoes, which are side by side, have their teeth staggered so that when a tooth on one shoe is in position to mesh with the lock pin, one of the teeth on the other shoe rides on top of the pin. Then when the wheel is tilted to the next position, the shoes reverse their actions. The shoe that was in mesh now rides on the pin and the other shoe meshes. That's easy enough to see. Now, how about the telescoping action? There aren't any detent positions there. That's right, Jerry. The telescoping shaft is locked in position by a sort of cam action. Inside the upper yoke of the steering shaft, there's a locking rod and a locking wedge that rides in a keyway in the yoke. The rod is actuated by a locking ring in the center of the steering wheel. When the ring is turned in, it forces the rod against the wedge, which slides upward along a ramp until it contacts the bottom of the keyway. The friction between the wedge and the keyway lock the inner shaft to the yoke. I hate to interrupt, men, but we're going to run out of time. Tom, why don't you tell Jerry about the special tools as a wind-up for this session? Okay, Tech. There are some new tools, as well as some that were used on previous models. You're already familiar with the steering wheel remover and the new steering column holding fixture. Well, be sure to use them both. The tilt-type assembly has the plastic inserts in the column, too. To remove the tilt actuator cover, cut a half inch off each arm of tool C3990. Then assemble it with a slide hammer from C3752 and one of the bolts from the signal cover remover C3954. There's a compressing tool to relieve spring pressure on the horn contact carrier so the C-ring can be removed. The raised portion of the tool pushes against the raised shoulder of the carrier. Special tool C4016 is used to remove the pivot pins from the tilt actuator housing. There's a pin on each side of the housing. Two new tools are required for the shift tube on tilt telescope columns. Tool C4045 pushes the tube out of the jacket and tool C4046 pulls the tube back into the jacket during assembly. The last tool is a molded plastic installer for installing the actuator cover. And that's the whole tool story for the tilt-type steering column. Hold it, Tom. There's something you better know about that installer. You can't use it with a column in the car. Here's why. This is the only steering column tool that requires a hammer. You have to tap the cover into place. And if the column is installed in the car, you'll break the shear pins and the breakaway capsules. So even if you're only replacing a turn signal switch on the tilt-type column, take the column out of the car. Now to wind up this session, just let me suggest that all you master technicians follow the recommended procedures for these new columns and pay attention to the precautions. If you do, you'll never get a bum steer.